Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at an absolutely beautiful World War II sniper rifle. This is a British No. 4 Mark I-T sniper rifle. Uh, the T uh, designates it as a telescopic rifle. You'll see that uh, nomenclature in their earlier sniper rifles from 1918 as well. Now, this particular one is, of course, built on the number 4 Mark I rifle. That should be pretty obvious. Uh, what's interesting, just to begin with, is the British knew that they were going to want a sniper rifle built on this platform before they had even actually put the number 4 Mark I rifle into production. So the first batch of, of these sniper rifles were actually built on what were basically the leftover field trials rifles from the number 4 adoption program. These rifles were still sitting around at Enfield, and uh, in 1940, when they decided to start doing the testing to, uh, to make this a formal sniper rifle, they just went and grabbed those rifles and built them up in this configuration. And to this day, you can actually still occasionally, and theoretically, they are out there, but they're very scarce, you can still find original Trials number 4 rifles built into snipers like this. One of the cool things about the British military's habit of continuously reusing and updating guns is sometimes you get something that's in a modern configuration, but you can trace directly back to something really interestingly old. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, the way that when these went actually went into production, they were not built as uh, you know, sniper rifles straight from the factory. What they did instead was they took number 4 Mark I rifles out of regular stock, guns that had shown particularly good accuracy. And those guns were then sent to Holland & Holland, the famous British gun makers, where they were configured like this. So uh, scope mounting blocks were installed, uh, stock was fitted with this cheek riser, and, and everything was set up this way. Uh, so there are a number of modifications and markings to these guns, that are that were put on during that conversion process, and I have to say, it's become it. This is a fairly easy style of rifle to try and make a fake of, to make counterfeits or reproductions, depending on how you want to term them. Uh, and finding one that is in pristine, original, undeniable, uh, correct pattern is actually fairly difficult because again, a lot of these went through retrofit and rebuild. And so they may have changed form over the decades. This particular one is, as far as I can tell, perfect. By the way, this rifle came from the collection of Alan Coors, if you're interested in its provenance. Um, that definitely uh, gives it some sway in the collecting community. He had really good taste in firearms, and it should not be surprising that he would have an absolutely immaculate number 4 Mark I T. Anyway, um, Let's go ahead and take a look at how you can authenticate these, and what they actually did to make these rifles, and then we'll come back and talk about how they were used, and what they're actually capable of. Let's start by looking at what they did mechanically, and then we'll look at the markings and the authentication. So, of course, we have a telescopic sight mounted on here. It was the number 32 scope. Um, the scope, interestingly, was actually originally designed for use on the Bren gun, never actually was applied to the Bren gun, but they had that scope around and they decided it'd make a dandy sniper rifle scope. So it's three power magnification, it has a nine degree field of view. This particular one, as you can see, is a Mark III. However, when they started they were using the Mark I version of the scope. Uh, that was of course in February of 42. They introduced a Mark II in April of 1943, and then this, the Mark III, was introduced in October of 1944. Unlike uh, many other uh, you know, military sniper rifles of World War I and World War II, this does have both windage and elevation adjustments built into uh, the actual reticle, built into the scope. So you're not adjusting the base at all. Um, these are two minute of angle clicks for both elevation and windage. And the scope is centered on the bore line. So again, unlike many other sniper rifles, uh, does not have an offset scope. That does mean you can't use stripper clips to load it. However, you can take the magazine out and load the magazine manually, because it is a detachable mag, or you can just load the rifle one round at a time. Um, I think the issue of requiring stripper clips in a sniper rifle in World War I or World War II context is not really particularly important. And obviously the British agreed. In order, in order to actually put the scope on the rifle, uh, two base pads were mounted by Holland and Holland, here and here, and the scope is actually attached by two 
hand tightened screws. So we can go ahead and take this off. These came with a scope case so that you could protect the scope when you weren't actually out using it. There we go. So that's the scope and its mount. And then these two pads, mounting points, were added to the receiver of the rifle. You'll notice the battle sight on, on the iron sights has been ground off. That's to allow clearance uh, for the optic to come back here. And a cheek pad, or a cheek riser, was added so that uh, when you stick your face on the rifle, your face is actually lifted high enough to get a nice, clean picture through the scope. This is something that is weirdly absent on a lot of other World War I and World War II military sniper rifles. I'm not sure why people didn't do it, but it really makes a big difference uh, in shootability. So uh, kudos to the British for actually doing that. And then one other kind of less important modification was the addition of this specialty sling swivel. Uh, this is intended for use with a special shooting sling, uh, and that was added specifically to the sniper rifles. Receiver socket here. We've got a whole bunch of information there. So uh, we have 1944, which is the production date. We have, it's a little hard to see on this one, but it says M47C right up here, and that is the manufacturer's code for BSA, uh, who actually produced the rifle. We have a serial number, R35125 there, and then perhaps most important for us right now is this TR. That is a stamp that was added before the guns were converted to be sniper rifles, and that stamp indicates that this rifle shows good enough accuracy to be considered for conversion into a sniper. So you should find that on all sniper conversions. Holland and Holland, as part of their conversion process, added the cheek pads and then refitted the stocks to the guns, and they added a marking here on the bottom of the stock. That is S51, so that should also be visible on the guns. And then when the whole process was finished and the rifle was approved and good to go out the door ready for service, uh, an inspector stamp was added just here next to the ejector screw, and that's a T. So that's another marking that should be on any legitimate, authentic number four sniper. With any sniper rifle with a detachable scope, you're obviously going to want some way to make sure that you don't get the scopes mixed up. Because, of course, these bases and scopes are zeroed to specific guns, and you don't want to lose that if there's a way not to. So uh, you'll find these all numbered in a specific way. The base is marked with the serial number of the rifle. So this is the same number that we just saw on the socket, on the receiver socket. And then the rings are also numbered. So the bottom half of the ring is actually an integral part of the base. So we know this is already connected to our rifle serial number. And then the two rings will have sequential numbers. Um, that seems to be a weird way to do it, but I suppose it, it keeps the rear one and the front one uh, specific and separated. So in this case, we have A34 and A35, but those numbers will be different on every rifle, and they don't have any particular bearing to anything else. Uh, what's important here is that they match. So you have A34, the top part of the ring, matching A34 on the bottom, and the same with 35. Then there's also a backup system. Uh, the scope has its own serial number. Every one of them is different, of course. So 24571. They went ahead and marked that on the top of the stock of the rifle, so 24571. That's not matching the rifle's serial number, and it's easy to make the assumption that it should be and think that this would be a mismatched stock. But no, that's the scope serial number. Down here you have the rifle's serial number, and they're not the same. For comparison's sake, we have here a Mark I, a Mark II, and a Mark III scope. And so you can see a few things changed on the outside. The really visible difference is when they went from 2 to 3, the adjustment box is kind of changed a bit. Um, but beyond that, there's not a lot of external difference between any of these. Uh, mostly what they were doing is refining the scopes internally to make them more durable, um, as well as also being uh, less expensive to produce, but primarily to make them more durable. Uh, one thing I do want to correct, I think I said earlier they were two minute of angle clicks. Um, that was actually on the Mark I. It has a two minute of angle windage adjustment. On the Marks II and III, they did change that to one minute of angle for the adjustments. And then the elevation is not in minutes at all. That's in, it's a, a bullet drop compensator. So it's a range adjustment uh, with 50 yard increments from zero out to 1,000 yards. 
I also want to point out a couple changes that were made on this one, or updates to it. This blue painted B uh, is for blooming, and that was a, a modification. I'm not... it's not exactly clear what the change was technically, but it was done to improve light transmission in the scopes uh, for low light conditions. And then this is also marked with a red painted W, which means that the scope was also uh, treated after, uh, after production to make it more waterproof. That was one of the problems with these, is they tended to have problems with uh, moisture getting into them and fogging them. And so the British made an effort after the war, uh, well during and after the war, to improve the waterproof qualities of these scopes, because they would go on to use them for quite some time after the war. Go ahead and put the scope back on now. Uh, note that the front mount is just a hole, a threaded hole. The rear mount has this uh, sort of three-sided uh, trapezoidal block, uh, and what that does is pull the scope in and center it uh, exactly so that it returns to zero every time. Also notice that instead of lock washers, these uh, scope mounting screws actually have little springs, uh, flat wire springs in there, uh, to prevent them from coming loose. So. You don't need to... this is one of those things that you don't need to over-tighten. Like, you put it on, you get it nice and, you know, finger tight, but there is no... you do not want to go out there and, like, get a set of vice grips and try and crank these all the way down. It's not going to help anything. It will, in fact, hurt things. So finger tight is fine. The scope zeroed, it'll, it'll return to zero, you're good to go. Specific numbers are a little bit hard to nail down, uh, but production of these was somewhere between about 23,000 and about 26,000 uh, during World War II. So a lot of them would go on in British service uh, long after the war. In fact, the uh, L42A1 snipers that were eventually built in 7.62 NATO were all actually converted from these guns. So uh, they would have in a, a long life in the British Army in many forms. Really. This is overall a fantastic sniper rifle of World War II. Um, perhaps the only real downside to it, to it is its weight. These come in at 11 pounds 8 ounces. Um, that's 5.3 kilos, so they are a bit of a hefty rifle. Um, that scope is big and heavy, the mount has a lot of metal in it, uh, but I think there are a lot of guys who were perfectly happy to carry the weight because of the reliability and the accuracy and just the overall shootability of these rifles compared to a lot of their contemporaries. So these were officially introduced in February of 1942, and they were actually, in theory, deployed to the North African campaign. However, the fighting in North Africa didn't really lend itself to sniper rifle usage, and they really didn't see any practical application until the invasion of Italy in 1943, and that's when you would see them actually really put into use and, and utilized. Um, they would have... production would continue until the end of the war, and this would remain the standard British sniper rifle for quite some time after the war, um, ultimately replaced by the L42A1, which, by the way, we have a video coming up on, so stay tuned if you're interested in the progression of British sniper rifles. We'll cover that one as well. Uh, and as far as, like, what these rifles were actually required to be able to do, so, like, what's the performance of this? That's... I think that's a question that is... maybe the answer is going to be something that a lot of people probably won't expect. We're living in an era today where a one minute of angle rifle, you know, something that can shoot a one inch group, one inch circle at a hundred yards, is kind of taken as the default base. Like if you can't do one minute of angle, well, you suck and your rifle sucks and your scope sucks and you should just throw it all away and start over. That's not the actual standard in 1942. These rifles had to be able to put seven out of seven shots into a five inch circle at 200 yards. So that's a two and a half minute of angle requirement. And then they also had to be able to put six out of seven rounds into a 10 inch circle at 400 yards, which is, if we, if you look at the, uh, the trigonometry, that's the exact same size dispersion. Uh, that's still two and a half minute of angle, but you're allowed to have one flyer that's outside that group at 400. So these are not one minute of angle rifles. They weren't intended to be. The scope graduations aren't even one minute graduations. You can only adjust this thing two inches at a time, you know, two inches per increment at a hundred yards. The, the standard of accuracy in World War II was substantially lower than we would consider today, and I think a lot lower than people realized was considered acceptable back then. So uh, that being said, these are still magnificent rifles. They're really nice rifles, and um, 
well, any serious sniper rifle collector really ought to have one. Uh, if you would like to see more information on this particular one, if you'd like to see detailed pictures of exactly what a proper number 4 Mark 1 T ought to look like, as well as uh, the description of this rifle and its value estimate from Rock Island, uh, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to ForgottenWeapons.com, uh, where you can then move on to Rock Island's catalog page on this specific guy. Uh, it is actually being sold with a number of accessories, including the original transit case, scope case, um, some extra stuff that I didn't bring up onto camera. So check out the catalog to see all of those cool accessories that go with it. Thanks for watching.